Uncovering the secrets of the atmosphere and wanting to know how its changes affect us has always held the key to understanding the environmental problems of our planet. The Teide, due to its location and unique features, has always been a place where recognized scientists and technicians have looked for and found answers to their intellectual concerns. A growing interest among scientific communities has led to the creation of an atmospheric observatory, which is now a reference point for studying the problems related to climate change and to understanding how the increase of greenhouse gases, the evolution of the ozone layer and atmospheric aerosols have affected us globally. After a hundred years of activity and major technological developments, international scientific organizations still consider this place as one of the best in the world in which to study the atmosphere. The first scientific expeditions to the island date back to the mid-17th century. And to this day, the number of natural scientists and researchers that arrive at the island has continued to grow. The German naturalist Alexander von Humboldt was climbing the Mount Teide to study phytogeographic layers when he first observed what we today call the Sea of Clouds. Humboldt was followed to the islands by Darwin, who also made a series of suspended dust observations. He had already noticed the influence that the Kalima has upon the climate of the islands. Time after time, the uniqueness of atmospheric phenomena observed from the Teide has attracted the curiosity of scientists such as Leopold von Buch and Piazzi Smith. Piazzi Smith spent two months in the last Cañadas del Teide with his wife carrying out a study of the sky. He was the first person to identify the temperature inversion. As the number of observations increased, new questions were raised, which consequently encouraged other researchers to visit. Hugo Hergesel arrived in the Canarias on board a ship owned by the Prince of Monaco, and he conducted several sampling campaigns in the Orotava Valley and the Teide, from where he launched a series of balloons in August 1980. Cesarens de Bord also came to the islands, as did the American Lawrence Roch, who used test balloons to observe and study the structure and dynamics of the troposphere. During their expeditions, the researchers became captivated by the idea of having an observatory on the summit of Mount Teide as part of an ambitious international project. At the conference held in Monaco, the Spanish government was urged to set up an observatory on the summits of Tenerife, which would form part of a network of observatories throughout North Africa and Southern Europe to further study the atmosphere. Let us consider the fact that at the time, in addition to the scientific interest, there were very strong technological and commercial interests too. It was a time when aeronautics was being developed, and this was also one of the reasons why Germany, no longer via Professor Hugo Hergesel, but through the German imperial household, was so interested in the island of Tenerife, where they installed a provisional observatory. This they would tell the Spanish government about only after it was built. All these events encouraged King Alfonso XIII to sign two royal decrees ordering the Spanish government to construct the Isanio Observatory. Moreover, the observatory should be run by fully qualified personnel. This is why it was necessary to create a body of meteorologists at the staff, as Spain did not have a faculty of meteorologists at the time. This is basically how the atmospheric observatory of Isanio originated. The 
resulta curioso pensar It is curious to think about how researchers were looking for the most suitable conditions to study the atmosphere at the end of the 19th century and how these conditions are still true. They are exactly the same, still present here today. All of Isania's peculiarities, which have attracted scientists to the location throughout its history, make it a unique place and one of the best in the world for atmospheric research. The Isania Observatory is located on a mountain 2,400 meters above sea level and therefore has an extremely clean atmosphere which allows the center to perform highly accurate measurements of different components and physical atmospheric parameters. This information is absolutely necessary to answer the big questions on the atmospheric problems we are faced with today. How is the ozone layer evolving? Does the Montreal Protocol and the Paris Agreement work? How does climate change affect the planet and life on it? What responsibilities do humans have in climate change? Observing what goes on in the atmosphere helps us to answer many of these questions. Isania is one of the few stations in the Global Atmospheric Monitoring Program developed by the World Meteorological Organization, whose mission is to monitor the changes taking place in the atmosphere. And this is crucial because the changes taking place in the atmosphere are, in turn, causing the global climate and air quality to change too. The uh, Global Atmosphere Watch program is uh, the research program of the World Meteorological Organization and the program addresses atmospheric composition. Basically it's a collaboration of about 100 countries which is doing the analysis and quality control and that are doing science related to atmospheric composition. What is particularly important and is really very relevant and very critical topic now because if we speak about environmental problems, most of environmental problems are related to atmospheric composition. The key role of Isania in global atmospheric investigation is supported by relevant research and observation programs. The most important programs are closely related to major atmospheric problems. In the Greenhouse Gas Program, we measure the components that produce the most atmospheric heat. Isania has one of the longest series in the world with continuous measurements of these components. The atmosphere is almost entirely made up of nitrogen, oxygen and argon, but it also contains very small amounts of gases called trace gases. And some of these are greenhouse gases which are capable of absorbing and emitting infrared radiation. The temperature on the surface of the Earth is the result of a balance between the solar radiation that reaches Earth, which tends to heat the planet, and the infrared radiation emitted by the Earth back into space, which tends to cool the planet. Greenhouse gases complicate the exit of infrared radiation that goes into space to cool the Earth, which causes net heating, and means that the greater the amount of greenhouse gases we have in the atmosphere, the higher the balanced temperature is too. In order to guarantee correct and accurate results, high-precision instruments are used at the Isania Atmospheric Research Center. The measurements obtained contribute to climate change assessment adding information to IPCC reports. The IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel of Experts on Climate Change. We collaborate internationally in studying greenhouse gas cycles, as well as emissions and absorptions of different components. The GAW Global Greenhouse Gas Program is designed to measure the uh, global distribution of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. 
These measurements are used to understand the contribution of greenhouse gases to radiative forcing and changing climate. The free tropospheric conditions in Isanya, especially at night, are completely unaffected by island emissions. They are, therefore, representative of thousands of square kilometers of the Atlantic Ocean. All these physical features, the average temperature, the greater presence of water vapor in the atmosphere and altitude above sea level are factors which will have a strong impact on ecosystems, agriculture and on people's lives. Greenhouse gas measurements taken in situ are complemented by atmospheric column analyses performed by the FTIR infrared spectrometry. These processes involve very precise technology, which informs us about the atmospheric concentrations of compounds that leave traces in the infrared region of the solar spectrum. FTIR is an extremely precise technique which is very optically refined. There are about 25 to 30 instruments distributed around the world and Ithania has had one since 1999. We can find almost every component that absorbs infrared radiation. We monitor what is crucial to monitor in atmospheric composition nowadays, such as greenhouse gases, the ozone, as well as substances that destroy the ozone layer. We are able to divide the solar spectrum and measure it using the high spectral resolution. We can define each gas absorption line. From this absorption spectrum, seemingly so simple, we are able to ascertain all this information, the gases that are absorbing, the levels of gas concentration and where the gases are located. This infrared interferometer spectrometer is one of the 10 devices in the world that make up the total carbon column observing network, able to measure greenhouse gases with pinpoint accuracy and validate the data obtained from sensors on satellites, such as the IASI sensor on the meteorological satellite METOP, operated by the European Organization of Meteorological Satellites, UMETSET. We establish specific measurement protocols when the satellite passes above the observatory over the subtropical region. So what we do is measure in temporal and special coincidence with the satellite. We do this to find out if the satellites are measuring properly. Therefore, the land stations or supersites like Isania are validation supersites that need to be distributed throughout the globe in order to check and validate that satellites are measuring correctly. The evolution of supersite stations like Isania, where sophisticated measurements are recorded with very complex technique, will become increasingly important because these stations will be used as evaluation and validation points for future observations from space, from satellites and also for model validation. One of the most important parts of the ozone and ultraviolet radiation program is, of course, to study the impact of ozone layer depletion on doses of ultraviolet radiation. As we know, the ozone acts as a protection shield in the stratosphere around 25 kilometers up, and it's a real filter for high-energy solar radiation. In this program, we monitor ultraviolet radiation doses that reach ground level and affect the population. In 2003, following recommendations from the World Meteorological Organization, the Brewer Spectrophotometer Calibration Center for Europe was established in Isania. The observatory now has three Brewer spectrophotometers to take reference measurements for Europe. An exceptional calibration laboratory complemented by complex mathematical models and above all, a brilliant team of individuals. 
The brew is a device that is designed to measure ozone, but it does so by measuring ultraviolet radiation and therefore also provides measurements of ultraviolet spectral radiation, which means we can also establish vertical ozone profiles. With this equipment, we have recently been developing aerosol measurements in the ultraviolet range. Iberonesia was the first network of brewer instruments. Nowadays, uniting all the brew observations and producing data related to ozone, ultraviolet radiation and optical aerosol thickness has been established. There is a European network where other countries collaborate. It is practically a worldwide network. In addition to its role as International Calibration Center for Brewer Spectrophotometers, it is also involved in numerous other projects that investigate ozone. One of them is the European network Oibrunet, which aims to unite all the brewer instruments in Europe, this number about 50, so that all the data is processed in the same way and standardized. The other project is Atmos, which seeks to improve the quality of ozone observations made with other devices. Yeah, Oibrunet is a network of brewer ozone spectrophotometers. These are instruments which measure the ozone layer 20 kilometers or so above our head and there are about 50 spread around Europe, 200 around the world, and UBrunet is attracting more and more of these stations to bring their data to a central database for processing and quality assurance. And this is where Isania comes in, where AMAT have provided the resources to run the database, and also for the regional calibration centre for the brewers, uh, which is also an integral part of the project. Yeah, we have a very close relationship since the last 20, 25 years. I have been here with our Dobson instrument for several times to calibrate, to check its quality. And uh, so we have a very, very close co connection between both observatories. As well as the brewers, we also work with the Pandora system, recently developed by NASA, which in addition to ozone and ultraviolet radiation is also capable of measuring aerosols, sulfur dioxide and especially gases that have the greatest impact on air quality. Furthermore, observing the evolution of the ozone layer is an essential part of the ozone sonder program. Probe balloons carrying meteorological and ozone sensors have been launched without interruption since 1992. The purpose of these types of measurements is not only to get a total value of ozone in a column, but also to know how it is distributed by levels with data gathered approximately every 10 meters. The flight equipment consists of a standard radio sonde equipped with pressure, temperature, humidity and wind sensors. The ozone probe carries a chemical sensor loaded with iodine dissolved in water which generates a small electrical current created by oxidation upon contact with ozone in the air, resulting in digital signal that is transmitted back to Earth in two second cycles. The probe is carried by a 1,200-gram latex balloon filled with helium. It ascends at an average speed of 5 meters per second for approximately two hours, resulting in altitude of 32 to 33 kilometers. When the balloon can expand no more and finally bursts, it returns slowly thanks to a parachute that cushions the fall as much as possible. At the end of 1999, the Asanya Center created the NILU radiometer network in Antarctica for the observation of ultraviolet radiation and total ozone content in the atmosphere. The National Institute for Aerospace Technology, the Argentine National Antarctic Council and the Finnish Meteorological Institute are all collaborating on the project. We developed a series of teams that work together. One station is always in the ozone hole, the other is practically on the border. Ushuaia is outside, but sometimes it is affected by the ozone hole. With these three stations, we were able to observe a complete profile of the ozone hole, which means we are essentially validating models and monitoring the atmosphere in real time. Destruction of the ozone layer is also monitored by the NDACC network whose mission it is to detect changes in atmospheric composition. 
With these very precise measurements, we can validate these models, validate predictions, and consequently make decisions on the evolution of the ozone layer. We are part of the most important radiation network in the world, that is the baseline surface radiation network. We measure ultraviolet and infrared solar radiation, which play a very important role in modulating the Earth's climate. We have been working for many years with the observatory of uh, Isania. We started off doing uh, measurements of uh, solar UV radiance 20 years ago. And currently we are here for a European project where we are measuring the ozone column over Izania. We are using for that various instruments from uh, Fourier transform spectrometers to diode array spectrometers. And we are trying to improve the measurement of the ozone to reduce the uncertainties. One of the reasons Izania is so important is due to its proven ability to perform very reliable reference radiometric measurements. This is why it acts as a calibration center for many international stations. The angle calibration system allows us to simulate the position of the sun from dawn to dusk and to establish a response from the equipment to calibrate in relation to the position of the sun in the sky. Stations in the GIW program, like Isania, are known as super sites. Researchers will find powerful infrastructure and guaranteed long-term observations in very high quality. Isania is a worldwide reference in another area of investigation through its atmospheric aerosol research program. In 2015, the Isania Observatory was recognized as a test facility for the remote sensing of aerosol and water vapor properties by the World Meteorological Organization and more specifically by the International Commission on Observation Methods. Aerosols are matter in solid or liquid states that drift in the air. They range in size from very few microns to tens of microns. Aerosols exist naturally in the atmosphere and, in fact, they play an important role in the climate as we know it. Problems started with the Industrial Revolution when new types of aerosols and other chemical compositions entered the atmosphere as a consequence of emissions produced by human beings. These particles have an influence on the climate because they can absorb or disperse solar radiation. They affect the size of water droplets in clouds, precipitation patterns, and consequently, they also affect the water cycle. We measure aerosols that arrive in Isania in mainly two air currents. One of them is a current that influences the Canary Islands from west-northwest and brings us aerosols that come principally from North America. These have relatively low concentrations of pollutants. The other important one is the Saharan air current, an airstream that flows from North Africa to the Caribbean and the Americas, carrying large amounts of dust from the desert and raising it to altitude of over 1,000 meters before dispersing it over much of the North Atlantic. This suspended dust affects the climate. On the one hand, it means that part of the solar radiation that reaches the Earth is backscattered into space due to the large amount of dust particles suspended in the air. On the other hand, the same dust particles serve as condensation nuclei or nuclei for ice clouds, such as Cyrus. The other great effect of Saharan dust aerosols on the North Atlantic has to do with ocean fertilization. When dust from the Sahara is deposited in the ocean, it releases iron that dissolves into the sea, acting as a nutrient for phytoplankton. This obviously has enormous consequences for many aspects of the planet. One of them is that by increasing biomass capacity, we are also increasing the ocean's capacity to absorb carbon dioxide in the atmosphere.
The Sunny Observatory began its Saharan Dust program in 1987. Today, it's one of the world's longest-running programs. Furthermore, Isania is the only observatory that performs measurements within the Saharan air layer. This means that if Isania stopped measuring, we would lose all the information we have on the properties of Saharan dust in the Saharan air layer. This set of data is part of the Global Atmosphere Watch Network, and it is studied collectively in different research projects, such as the European project Actris. If you want to uh, know, uh, to predict how uh, climate will change, what you need to know is uh, what, how the composition of the atmosphere will change. And the composition of the atmosphere is short-lived climate species like aerosols. They act an influence on climate, and so we need to monitor them. And what is really important is to monitor them in the long term. We need long time series. And this is why the European Commission and uh, 22 European countries have now decided to uh, organize themselves into what we call a European research infrastructures called ACTRIS. And ACTRIS is about monitoring, providing information about the composition of the atmosphere and uh, the, the change in substances like reactive gases or aerosols. During these last 30 years, we have seen the amount of dust from Saharan air to the Atlantic has undergone high variability, changing significantly from one year to the next. This variability is mainly due to large-scale meteorological changes in North Africa, characterized by these meteorological elements more common in summer and by a pattern we call the North African Dipole, discovered here at the Observatory of Brisania. The patterns consist of high pressures in North Africa and low pressures associated with the monsoon in tropical Africa. In order to determine the chemical composition of aerosols and discover their origin, we take samples of aerosols in filters using sensors and these filters are then analyzed in the laboratory. In the weighing room, we treat the filters used for aerosol sampling and this treatment follows a European norm. We use different materials such as Teflon, quartz, paper or fiberglass filters. And as you can see here, for example, the difference between a non-sampled filter and a filter with the distinctive ochre color of Saharan dust. We use about five methods to analyze and verify aerosol chemical compositions. First, using automatic instruments, we establish aerosol formations that are present, and then through chemical analysis, we confirm what proportion of these aerosols in ammonium sulfate of industrial origin, what proportion is desert dust, what proportion is sea salt, or what proportion is soot. Remote sensing techniques are also used to study aerosols. Isania Observatory is a calibration center for Aeronet, the most important network in the world for observing atmospheric aerosols managed by NASA. It uses the Simil Sun Lunar Photometers, which Isania helped to develop. In order to understand vertical distribution of aerosols in the atmosphere, scientists at the observatory in Santa Cruz use a method called LIDAR, with a laser that points at the sky. This is our LiDAR system. It is a micropulse LiDAR. As you can see here, it's quite complex. It consists of a telescope and different types of acquisition devices. It is part of a worldwide network, the MPLNet network founded by NASA, and it consists of over 50 stations that are located around the world, which use instruments similar to this one to provide accurate information on the distribution of aerosols and clouds and columns. It gives us vertical and temporal information about the aerosols we have in the atmosphere column above us right now. Isania is one of these platforms. It's one of the few platforms in Europe and in the world that can provide more than several decades of measurements. There's very, very few. I'd say there is less than 10 in the world that can provide this kind of information.
for Isanya to continue being a point of worldwide reference, its facilities and instruments must be kept in optimum condition. This requires the continued support of the essential systems team, which is comprised of highly qualified technicians and engineers. We are truly dedicated to supporting all the scientific groups that are working at the Isanya Observatory, whether these groups are our own here at the Isanya Atmospheric Research Center or whether they are foreign or national groups from outside the center. We also have to maintain the general infrastructure, the building itself, the residence and housing area, the observation tower with all the instruments inside. Not only do we develop our work here at the Sunny Observatory, but also at our facilities in Marina Street, where there is a small observatory. In addition, at the Botanic Observatory, we have an ozone sounding station, at the Teide, where we have a small initial observatory of radiation and meteorology, and at the Simul station installed in North Africa. Yeah, is, I would say, very well seen from uh, the international community. I mean, it's one of the few places where you can do research, and you can do research because you have there people. And this is, this is a fundamental aspect. I mean, you can have many instruments at one place, but if you don't have the people to operate the instrument, it's going, not going to work. It's not only operating the instrument, it's also providing information that's of very high quality. Isania is one of the two stations in the world where you can make uh, measurements of uh, solar irradiance in very clean atmospheres. Isania is a very nice station, not only from the surrounding, but also the weather conditions are wonderful here for making these special measurements and to calibrate the instruments. And Isania plays a key role in ensuring such a traceability for the region of Europe and of Africa. It's also an important place for the future where instrument have to be kept running and people have to be kept with the same level of high education to operate this instrument and teach other people to operate the instruments. It has been 100 years since the first observations took place at the current site of the Isania Observatory and this is why the observations made in stations like Isania are so crucial for the study of climate and atmospheric evolution on Earth. Throughout its 100-year history, Isanya has consolidated itself as a worldwide reference point for researching not only the changes that are taking place in the atmosphere, but also the role humans play in this process. The vast experience alongside technological capability and human capital will allow the Isanya Atmospheric Research Center to continue finding solutions to the problems that will mark life on the planet in the future.